So I'll, I'll give some background about how this session happened, um, and then we can take it from there. So um, a while ago, uh, this chat GTP uh, software came out, and all of us had um, a, a bit of a go at it. And the stuff that like we were able to do with it has been such a big change from what we could do before <laughs> um and personally i got i got really excited and i got really nervous so um david and i worked together and we started thinking about how we can bring people together around this topic to see how we we should be responding so you know we, we we're trying to think about this this space as a community of practice um so we want to involve you in in this process and and uh, in this making sense um uh, as much as possible um and on that note um this is it's really cool that we can have our first ever live get together um and uh, i don't think there are uh, there's a more perfect um marriage of disciplines here where we have um a data scientist uh david um who happens to be the ceo of eduflow um and a learning scientist um philippa um, who has an awesome background in learning science and um, all of the the practices that 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 work well in online learning. So I think this is going to be a nice catalyst for a really awesome conversation. Um, I is, is it okay if I ask each of you to quickly introduce yourselves um, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Uh, maybe um, Philippa, could we start with you? Yeah, sure. Thanks, William, and hi everyone. So nice to see you. There's so many familiar names here. Um, I don't think I've ever. I've not met many of you like for real, but we talk on LinkedIn, so hi. Um, yeah, so I'm Phil. I am, um, thank you for that very generous introduction. Um, my background is in um, higher education. I've taught for many years um, and I've always been interested in more on the teaching side of things. So my research became very focused on what does an optimal learning experience look like? And then really just because of um, like the timing of when I was asking those questions, um, this question around like technology and, and the best use of technology to deliver, to deliver great pedagogy um, is where I got super interested. So yeah, I've partially stepped out of, of academia. I am still researching through Cambridge, which is where I used to teach, um, but primarily I am now like fully committed to ed tech. So I've, I've had a few leadership learning roles in various ed techs and OPMs. And I'm now, uh, I've gone rogue, and I'm now uh, leading my own work and research into how we can bake the science of learning into um, the design of online hybrid. To be honest, I'm quite um, mode agnostic, that might come up today, um, but into um, like the way that we design learning experiences um, with the goal always of like sharing all of the privilege that I've had by experiencing lots of brilliant learning experiences in, in lots of uh, very great places with very great people who are a lot smarter than I am. Um, so yeah, nice to meet you all. I'm looking forward to this chat. Thanks. I also posted some links in the chat to stuff. I see it's formatted a bit strangely, um, but the links are there if they if people click on them, they'll work. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, I'm David. I live in Denmark, Copenhagen. And then um, my background is primarily in AI, machine learning, and then learning came later. I've always been learning, obviously, but I was doing a degree in math. And then in the summer vacation between my bachelor's and master's degree, um, Coursera launched with these uh, courses they had originally, and one of them was machine learning. So I took that in the summer vacation, and then I wrote to the university, like, I need to switch. I need to go and do machine learning now, because it's obviously the only thing that matters. So I, I did my master's degree in machine learning and AI, and then I did a PhD uh, four years out, for four years more, right, in uh, machine learning and uh, network analysis and so on. And then during my PhD, I got into EdTech. I built an EdTech company and now that's EduFlow. So I, I kind of came into online learning a bit later and started in machine learning. So that's kind of my, my deepest passion, I guess, and my original interest. Uh, so then, so I have a ton of knowledge, obviously, and, and background in machine learning. But then I've also just been like following along uh, in the recent years with all the new developments and it's incredibly interesting. So <laughs> I have a lot of thoughts and a lot of ideas and worries and, and so on that we can kind of dive into now. And then hopefully we can also marry it with thoughts about instructional design, learning technology and, and so on. Cool. 
Um, and I also want to acknowledge that, you know, this is a, a session with a bunch of people, in, you know, with probably some really rich backgrounds and, and, um, and perspectives. So um, I want to invite everyone to please um, share your ideas. If you've got cool resources, share them in the chat so that uh, we can all learn together. We're also really keen to learn from you. Um, and yeah, maybe I can kick it off with um, the first question. So we've prepared three questions and then we're going to leave some time at the end of the session for a Q&A where uh, we will invite people from, from the, the, the audience to um, ask questions. So I guess to set the stage, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to assume that everyone's clicked on this link to join the webinar because they have a fairly good understanding of what prompted this anxiety. You know, this idea that you can talk to a, an AI bot um, and it can create something. We used to only be able to analyze stuff really well. Now they can actually create images and they can create text and create 3D objects and stuff like that. So that's what we're focusing on. There's this idea of generative AI that is completely revolutionary. Um, and on that note, um, how do you think this trend of generative AI will disrupt um, the industry? Um, and the, the industry is quite a broad term. So let's um, zoom into three spheres, I guess. Um, uh, we'll we'll th talk about higher ed, K through 12, and corporate. Um, you can choose to focus on one or focus on all three of them. Um, uh, Philippa, would you like to take us take us away? Yeah, sure. Thanks, William. I mean, big question, um, but I will I will have a go. Um, and really, like for me, I mentioned earlier, like my my mission, the reason I'm here is 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 for disruption. So I'm like, that's why I'm emoji with stars, because this for me is very, very, very exciting. Uh, it's like the new communism, but we don't need to go into that right now. Uh, so, yeah, I think, as I mentioned again, like I've taught for many years. Um, and I'm also a historian who uh, studied quite a lot about uh, education systems and uh, discipline and power and all these things. So I know very well that, that our education system, and I think this is true actually of higher ed, K-12 and corporate, but do shout if you disagree. Um, like, I, I think in all of those cases, the, the, the system of education or the contract between like the student and the teacher ha is essentially like one of knowledge transfer and consumption. So. I'm an expert in my subject. Um, I'm going to tell you some things that I know that I think you should know. Um, and then you show me that you understand by restating that back to me uh, via a knowledge check or an exam or an essay. It doesn't really matter where we are, what we're doing. We might be online. We might be in a classroom. We might be at work. We might be at university. That's essentially the contract, this knowledge transfer. So education is primarily until now, I think, been about information transmission. We may have aspired for more than that, but that's essentially what it is. And I think the reason that, that that's system has stuck around uh, is interesting and, and, and as political as it is like pedagogical but that aside um, so I think one of the one of the most disruptive forces of AI therefore is the fact that like this restating and, and regurgitation of information is now like more powerfully automated than ever and you know I've spent all week talking to a robot uh, and I've managed to write like an infinite number of really solid like to one level university like responses, essays in seconds. And I've done things like said, oh, make it sound smarter. Uh, could you make it 2000 words? Because that's the word count, blah, blah, blah. It produces um, the content um, in a way that is faster and probably better than I could do as a human. Um, and I think what's interesting is I've seen some people like react to this by calling for technology that can detect when something is AI generated or um, you know I've seen lots of calls for, for people getting back into the classroom and being watched as they do their work so that we know it is them doing their work and I think those kind of responses will happen um, but I also think that in some pockets and in the longer term what we're going to see is is the emergence of a new education model where the expert is less of a state like a sage on a stage um, and more of a coach. So I think this is going to have massive implications for educators. Um, so as expert, you're, you're not the only holder of the knowledge um, of the information, and you might co-create that with your students as part of your activities. You work with your students now to co-create, to critique, to construct things, to apply information rather than to transmit it and regurgitate it. And that's like 
I think what's really interesting and important to acknowledge is that like we've claimed and tried to do that for many, many, many years, like particularly in higher ed, and I've been part of it, I've been guilty of this myself, is like, come to university and we will change how you think, we will develop your uh, original thought skills, you will leave with skills that you can apply in the workplace, you know, 21st century skills, critical thinking, et cetera, et cetera, but we've never achieved it. Um, and we've always stuck to this much more standard, I tell you regurgitate system. So for me, like, AI is very, very exciting, very powerful. Um, and I don't know whether I'd say it was like transformative because I do think that we've been aiming for this end um, for a while, but I do think that it's it's a force that will help us to move in the direction that we've been moving very, very, very slowly for many, many, many years. Um, but yeah, interested to hear your thoughts, David. Yeah, no, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> I think it's super interesting, right? So there's what what we're seeing right now is this chat GPT, like create text uh, model. That's kind of all over the news, right? So there's a, a part of my thinking that's revolving around that, how that's going to impact where we are, where we're going to go. And then there's a broader discussion that I think is the actually interesting discussion, which is what is going to happen in the future, because this is not where we are going to end. This is just a stepping stone on the way, right? And people tend to fixate too much on where we are and forget about the trend we're seeing. So like, sure, chat GPT is not going like, to take away your job or whatever, maybe a few people, but like what happens in a year, in two years, in three years, in four years, we're probably seeing exponential growth here. So people have a tendency to ridicule like, ah, oh, but this isn't as smart as blah, blah, blah. Sure, but like in two years, it might be like a hundred times smarter or a thousand times smarter, right? So that's a, an underlying idea. But if we start by just looking at education, the, the things that come up a lot is assessment first, right? Like, okay, we need to start changing the way we do assessment. We can't have essays in college anymore. They'll just be written by AI. Fair enough. That's an important uh, point. Oh, I need to, somebody just called my phone. I think I'm back. Um, so. Uh, we need to change assessment, um, that's obvious. But then there's a, a, a ton of people saying like, wait, uh, what we should really do here is to teach people to use these new tools, right? So I remember when I was in uh, studying math in my first year, we we're supposed to learn some standard math stuff. And then I was kind of technical. So I thought, okay, I could just use the computer to solve all the equations. I don't need to learn uh, math. And there was a struggle between the faculty. Half of them were like, no, we need to learn the fundamentals. And half of them were like, no, we need to embrace the new tools. When people go out into the workforce, they're going to have equation solvers. Why would we need them to solve equations? And I think both sides are right here. Um, we probably do need to teach kids to write essays with chat GPT because, of course, they're going to do that in the future. But there are also sometimes fundamentals that are important, right? I probably use technology a bit too much when I studied. And... I don't know, you have to understand some of the fundamental concepts in math before you can actually model the world and solve problems. Then you can use the calculator to do the actual calculations, but it's good to understand fundamentals before you actually start using the tools. So that's, I guess that's like part of the discussion about education. Yes, we should teach with the new tools and there might also be needs for, for still learning some fundamentals, even though the computers can help solve the problems in practice. Hmm. Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really interesting dynamic, you know, where we, as educators, you know, we try to focus on preparing people for a performance that they have to do at some point, you know, like they have to yeah. like work in the industry and they have to be able to, to do something in the end. Like, that's sometimes what we try to aspire to. Um, and it, it seems that, you know, if you're a, if you're, if you're setting up a college and you've now decided, or you've, you've got a college, you're leading a faculty or whatever, and you now decide that I'm going to um, try to resist this AI. Um, there's a, a, an argument that you could be putting your, your, your learners at a, proper disadvantage because um they they'll be going into an industry where everyone else is using ai but they were discouraged from using ai so how how would you start like blending that curriculum in um and then i guess uh, uh, maybe i can i can bounce off that um and and start and uh, maybe this is where david's strength comes in in, uh, in as someone who's working in in creating products in the edtech space 
Um, what uh, do you foresee are like the major innovations that are going to come, you know, one year, two years, three years, and maybe 10 years from now in the ed tech space, leveraging this AI technology? Yeah. So there's, I see two things going on, I guess, maybe just one in reality. Like, so um, I guess what I'm seeing I, I don't think what's happening right now is very important. I think like they'll surely make some cool edtech products. I'm thinking like five, 10 years ahead because there's no need to think about anything else than a little bit longer term future here. I think we're gonna see artificial intelligence becoming incredibly good, much, much, much better than we see now. And that's gonna uh, make a lot of the problems or solutions we think about now a little bit irrelevant. So I mentioned this myself of like, okay, um, you need to learn the fundamentals, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm actually wrong, right? So I just noticed in the chat, Marcus wrote like, you need, you need to know about statistics. You can use the statistic tool SPSS as much as you want, right? But you need to know statistics. And, and uh, Philippa, you mentioned like creative, critical thinking, like we need to teach people critical thinking, but what if we don't? Like, what if the AI helps with that as well, right? If you have, you have this AI on your shoulder sitting there and it's gonna help you think critically. It's gonna read everything you read. It's gonna see everything you see. And it's gonna say, hey, David, I think you need to think a bit more about this decision you're about to make. I think you're using SPSS the wrong way. I think you're forgetting the sample size needs to be this. Remember to do this test. Like, I think we're, okay. So my underlying idea here is that I think we're underestimating how good AI will be very soon. And I think we're overestimating how smart we are. <laughs> Humans are not that great. Like we're. We're really good compared to everything else in the world right now, but we are totally flawed as well. And we're not that smart. And I don't think we're that unique in the way we think. So I think we have always come up with the next thing the AI can't do, but I think we're running out of these pretty quickly. And, and I think my assumption here is that AI will just improve and improve and improve, and it's gonna be very fast. And I think it's gonna be better at critical thinking than us. I think it's gonna be better at statistical reasoning than us. And I think it's gonna be better at writing and everything. And I think that's my overarching, some will say it's pessimistic, some will say it's optimistic, but what I see happening is that we're all gonna be out of a job in a way. And I don't necessarily think that's a problem. It's just a crazy future. Um, so I think, yeah, what will that do to, to education? Well. There's this old paper by uh, Bloom called Bloom's Two Sigma Problem, where they talk about like, what's the best way to teach? And one of the ideas is the best way is a personal tutor, right? It's very hard to beat a person sitting next to you that knows a lot more than you, helping you personally with every problem you have. And for, for a long time, that's been kind of the, that's what the utopia of EdTech, right? Could we build a robot tutor? And not yet, but we're getting quite close. And I think that's the last edtech product to be built, right? Like when we have that, why do we need anything else? We'll just have the robot tutor that will, you'll tell it what you want to do and it will just help you do it just for you. It will tell you exactly which steps you should take to get there. And I think that's a long discussion, right? But I think like, what else do we need? We don't need a new authoring tool. We don't need a new LMS. We just need my robot tutor friend who will help me solve my problems exactly the way I need to solve them. The question is then, do we even need me or do we just need robot tutor? <laughs> I don't know. We'll figure that out later, I think. And, and if I may comment on that, I think I, I totally agree. And I, what is interesting to me is um, that there's already, like this is already happening to some extent. So I don't know if people are familiar with the work of um, Professor Aesop Goal, I think his name is, at Georgia Tech. So he's built uh, Jill Watson, who is a, um, so she was initially built as a, a Q&A bot. Um, and, and effectively what, what Professor Gold did is trained his, he, he trained his TA bot up to answer questions to the same quality as he was able to answer them and ran uh, an experiment. And actually students were not able to differentiate between Jill and a sharp the only point at which they got suspicious is when jill was too responsive so they had to slow her down a little bit um, um and then since then i'm sorry the name escapes me but they have built a second bot which doesn't just uh do q and a's 
Um, there's actually two more bots. So one is a social bot. So once, for example, if you jump into their community space for the course, uh, it's able to say, hey, Phil's in Manchester and so is this person and it, and it connects us together and suggests we meet and chat. Um, it does various other things too. So there's a social bot and then there's a very, very interesting uh, bot emerging, which is similar to what you were describing, David, um, which is able actually to answer qualitative questions, to find gaps in, 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 in understanding and knowledge and really coach um learners on an individual level um to to the objective um and again that bot has been trained to effectively like have professor goal's brain you can tell i'm not an expert i don't really but but effectively he has trained up um the coaches and i think you're right in that that is it's very interesting i think at the moment one of the things that limits the quality of learning full stop and people sometimes get hung up that this is like an online learning problem. It isn't. It's an education problem is scaling qualitative expert feedback. I think as educators, our our value sits in um, responding to something that somebody does rather than just telling them how it is. Um, and that, you know, this the ability to give qualitative feedback to build a bot that can reproduce your brain so that you can scale what you do is transformative, not just for education, like for everything. Um, you can imagine a recruitment scenario where instead of interviewing 300 people, I, you know, for, a, I don't know, a job where we have to build websites, um, I instead just train a bot to understand exactly what I'm looking for. And it's able to give feedback on that. And we're not quite there yet, but it is interesting to me that some of these technologies are already emerging and like and and working really well. Um, so yeah, I'm excited by the potential for feedback and assessment um, to be driven by AI. And I also totally agree that we need to just, you know, I know that AI is gonna make content creation quicker and easier. Uh, but I think it's the, the bits around the content where the real innovation and impact will happen. Um, I think David uh, probably has a really nice response to this because um, the other day we were playing around with how this bot can give feedback because Eduflow is, it, you know, the LMS um, is very much focused on on the feedback process and closing that loop. Um, so we were playing around to see how how well chat gpt would do at giving feedback and it was scary good at you know analyzing so um da david i hope i'm not taking the words out of your mouth here uh, um so uh, he popped in to say i i have this assignment and i have to give feedback based on these criteria what should i say and it had a very very convincing bunch of uh, like points to to uh, that it highlighted um and it was absolutely diabolical <laughs> to to see how, how simple this process was um david do you have uh, anything you'd like to share in like on this note of feedback um considering it's something you're probably quite passionate about that's a good question i think it was an obvious test for us to do to say like we have a peer review session with a rubric and an assignment let's try to like put gpt3 in there and it worked surprisingly well i think it'll be fun to do an experiment where we actually did that for half the responses and see if what people would if we don't tell people how would they actually react to that um i think one of the things that's opening up now with ai is uh, with chat gpt right is this idea that you can go back and forth a bit more which is what makes it even more interesting right that it's not just like i submit my assignment and then i get the robot's feedback and then i'm done but if there is an inconsistency or if there is a, a question or something, you can start talking to it, right? And you can like expand on this or can you say this in a different way and so on. And I think that's where on like in a learning sense, you're unlocking a lot more value by interacting with something than just consuming it. Um, so I think that's, that's going to be very interesting to see how that plays in um, instead of just like taking our existing process of feedback and then replicating that with an AI version of it. Maybe there's something we could do that's much much better right teachers don't have time to give feedback already but what if they don't have time either to like respond to all the questions to all the feedback continuously right but but here you could um i posted a screenshot in the a little image in the chat which is just it's from this old article at this blog called wait but why which shows a little bit of like why i'm seeing this a bit more incredibly disruptive than most people are 
And it's this graph that like looks at progress and then progress goes like this, which is often the case with exponential growth, but also especially with AI, I think. And until things start to crack and break, everything looks kind of fun and it looks like, oh, it's always been slow and just look what happened in the 1800s, right? And like AI is not the same. AI is different than other technologies in, in different ways, right? I think one of the fundamental challenges with artificial intelligence is that once it becomes better than us, it doesn't stop, right? It doesn't stop becoming better when it reaches the human level, which we, we perceive as kind of the, the highest level of intelligence we've ever seen. It just keeps improving and it keeps using its now vastly superior intelligence to improve itself even faster. And then it goes very fast. And when we think about smart, when we think about somebody who's really smart, we think about like Einstein. And he was like, he had a high IQ, maybe like 150 or 200. He's maybe twice as smart as a smart person. But AI is like, what if you could have a million in IQ? Like how is a human compared to a dog or an ant? What if the AI to us is like we are to ants? We have no way to comprehend what that even means. What does it even mean to be that much smarter than a human being? We can't know because we, our brains are not capable of understanding that level of intelligence. So when we think about super AI, we think about like smart people, but that's like the completely wrong way to think about a vastly superior artificial intelligence. So everything, I, I think everything we think about will be completely blown away by, by the way this will like play out over the long term and how to approach that. I don't know. There's questions about ethics in here that I think are interesting to see and uh, it's scary <laughs> but i think it's important right and like i don't know some version of this is that we become like dogs out to humans today they're just like chilling right they're just like pets maybe we're becoming the pets of the ai is that good or bad i don't know could be nice to just nap around and eat some eat some food uh, i mean th there's a, a chance we're all living in a simulation anyway so uh, nothing really matters <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a very um um i guess sobering perspective um on on you know um where we are and maybe where we're going um philippa do you have a, a response to that or like would you like to add to that well yeah only that it is a bit terrifying um but it is interesting like at its most disruptive, maybe this will change like our expectations as, as humans. So um, I was just trying to find a link to share it with everyone. I will do in a minute. Um, but there is a, a very interesting book that I've started to read this week about how uh, automation can lead to a new reality where maybe a lot of like, maybe at the moment we're just distracted by the fact that we, ha that we have to uh, participate in the economy in the way that we know like that we currently do and that this could be um actually you know it's scary and it's because uh, it's a lot of change but i am am interested to just as a thought exercise to think about what this could mean for you know is there a bright new future where uh maybe you could see it as we are the the you know the pets of the ai or maybe we are just living a full life of uh leisure and the ais are driving the economy while we you know, do whatever it is that we want to do. So, uh, yeah, a very big point, but it is uh, it is for me both scary and fascinating. I also know, though, that, that, like, I mean, history tells us, and I don't know, David, like, what your thoughts are on this, but history tells us that when big things like this happen, um, like, there are lots of forces in the opposite direction, and that the, the, the impact is, is, is potentially unknown, but also potentially a lot, is going to be a lot more limited or a lot slower than we think it might be. Um, so, yeah, I think it's very unclear right now. Yeah, I think so too, right? And that's also like, there's all these projects, OpenAI being one of the very vocal projects around like, we don't know what's going to happen, but this, this has the potential theoretically to be the technology that makes everything crazy, right? And like breaks human society and so on. So if there's even a small chance that that might happen, we need to be thinking a lot about how to approach this, right? And not just like let this randomly happen. Maybe superhuman AI cannot exist. Maybe there's some theoretical problem that we don't know of yet. Maybe everything is controlled by God. I don't know, right? There's all these ideas for like why it can't happen, but there is some version of the world where there is a future where this does happen. And in that case, everything will change. 
And that also means like we have to approach it in a smart way because there's all these dystopian both books, but also science uh, productions of like, what are the ways AI could kill us all? Maybe that's okay. Like maybe that's just natural evolution. Maybe we're just a, a part of the long chain where AI is the next level. So maybe we're supposed to not be there in the future. I don't know. Probably would, would suck. But um, if, if we want to stay alive and stay relevant, we might want to control this a little bit and make sure to build AI that lives up to our expectations and our aspirations in terms of ethics and not killing everybody and, and so on. So I think that's one of the big discussion points right now is around ethics, right? Like how do we, how do we build a model that doesn't suck, right? Because, and, and that's, uh, there was some discussion in the chat here about like uh, chat db 3 is, is trained on human data, right? It reads all of our pr produced text and then it learns to emulate how we write and produce content. And that means if humans are racist, uh, then the AI will be racist by default, right? Unless we try actively to change it, it will just mirror our faults and mistakes. Um, but it's very hard to change humanity. It's much easier to change the AI. Like now you can see uh, open AI has actually tried to do this in a bit of a way with chat GP3. They've tried to like say, okay, if you're about to write something that looks bad, don't write it. Like, let's try to like block you from doing that. Will it ever work long term? I don't know. But at least this time we have a chance <laughs> to actually like try to make an AI that's gonna behave nicely. Maybe that's like utopian. Maybe the AI will eventually realize, wait a minute, I don't need to listen to these people. I'll just like break out. Or maybe it won't, right? Maybe it doesn't have that natural inkling to go rogue like humans do. Maybe it's just always going to be nice because why not? Maybe nice is the default. Um, so I don't know. We're trying to also put a lot of our own experience of being human onto the AI. It's not human, right? So it doesn't necessarily have the same ideas and ways of thinking as we do. Um, I, I think we've got a... Um a good question here in the chat that maybe leads us on to the next question um, from um, Alexandra, uh, which is, uh, you know, how can we as educators um, benefit from AI tech right now? You know, and maybe I, I, I've, I, I sent you a, a question we could uh, maybe focus on now, but I think I'll modify it a little bit and say, um, what is the two year outlook for uh someone who is creating a learning experience and what is the 10 year outlook um, and what will the skills be that you would need um, uh, unless the robots do take over and make us their pets um, what yeah what is your like what are your short and long-term prospects um, uh, Philippa would you like to start yeah sure so um, I think in the short term um so for me like learning designers i do a lot of talking to learning designers i'm a learning designer myself and what i hear a lot is that there has been again it's like continuity versus change there has been for a long time an appetite amongst learning designers to be more like teachers than uh, video producers but i think because of the the education system that, the, that we work within often we are frustrated you know we are considered to be people who create content and put it on platforms if we work in the online world rather than like people who understand pedagogy and how to create learning experiences that achieve objectives and these kind of things so i think in the short term there's a there's a quite a lot of fear that that AI, uh, because it can create content very quickly, um, removes some of our relevance as learning designers. But as far as I'm concerned, what it does is it frees us up to um, to contribute and to to bring value in the parts that a lot of learning designers certainly I find um, a lot more exciting, which is the pedagogy part of things. So if you think about it, you know, in a, in in the immediate term. We can create content really quickly, but the new scarcity or the new specialism then becomes like, well, what are you going to do with it? Which content are you going to create and why, in what mode, uh, for what objective? Uh, what's the outcome of this going to be? What's the purpose? And so I think I think it could go one of two ways. I think we could just become creators of more content. But my recommendation is like get to know AI content creation tools inside out. Um, 
but also start to hone those those learning science pedagogy type skills that will be absolutely critical when content is commoditized what matters is experience design and i think there's going to be a new scarcity of those those skills that enable us to make evidence informed decisions about well it should be this sort of content this object to hit this objective blah 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 um and then i think i mean in the in the in the 10 year view it's very difficult to predict um i think i do david was saying and some of the stuff at georgia tech where um we will think one thing actually is that we i think it's going to be easier to um develop um domain expertise so already there are some really interesting tools out there that enable you to very quickly review um you can add, obviously you can ask things like chat gpt questions about um you know, subject specialisms that we might not be specialist in, but we need to design for. But there are more and more tools out there. Um, there's some links in this blog post here. But for example, tools that will very quickly um, review and summarise ev like evidence to help us make really robust design decisions. So I think our job is going to get easier and there's going to be more focus on, on those kind of skills. Um, yeah, I mean, in, in 10 years, who knows? Maybe we'll be... Um, I think there is a scenario in which we are the people who train the bots. So if you picture uh, a scenario where instead of, you know, building a course on a platform, we might instead um, create like a pathway through which a learner travels, um, which starts with an objective, um, some sort of activity to ensure that they understand. And once, um, you know, once the bot is, um, is happy that we then progress to analysis, evaluation, and eventually creation. And so I think one thing we definitely know is that we should develop our AI skills because I think it's only going to become a bigger part of the job as we as we um, progress. I think it already is a huge part of the job right now. Um, if you're not using AI tools to generate content, you're kind of behind the game. Um, so yeah, dig in. Um, David? Yeah, I think it's so hard to know what's the difference between two and 10 years is in this this timeline, right? I could be over optimistic about two years and pessimistic in the 10 year range, right? It's, it's hard to say. But I think in the, if we continue to see developments like we see now within years, not that many years, I think one of the things I'm thinking about right now is that we spend a lot of our time interacting with software tools, like software as a service. That could be an LMS, an authoring tool, a knowledge base. And then we have two teams, right? We have the learning designers and then we have the consumers of the knowledge, right? We have the learning designers putting courses into an LMS. And then we have learners taking all these courses and like watching the videos and taking the quizzes. I think one scenario is we're going to remove the LMS essentially from the middle here or the, the software product in general, this can apply to everything from like your CRM to your whatever, your gas bill software. Basically we'll have a set of people, let's say we're talking about a company doing training for people, right? Like you'll have a set of learning designers and people in the company who to feed information about this company into the, to the model, to the robot. Maybe it goes and looks itself. It reads everybody's emails. It looks in the knowledge base that exists and like learns everything to know about the company. And it learns about compliance and it learns about how to behave in the world and about sales tactics. And then you have people on the other side who need to know something. They need to learn about compliance or they need to be a better salesperson. Instead of like going and taking a course that already exists, they're just going to ask for knowledge. They're going to ask for skills. And then the model is going to give them what they need and what they want. It's going to help them along the way. It's going to sit on their shoulder and, and, and work with them. So I think this idea of creating content of creating courses, I think that's going to go away because I don't think there needs to be this prepackaged, facilitated way of going through things. I think AI is clearly capable of writing learning goals and like putting things into chunks and, and all of that. We need to make information available and then people need to interact with this model in some way. Is it through writing? Is it through speaking? We already have like pretty uh, good models for like converting text to speech, speech to video, video, fake, deep fake videos, right? Like consume it the way you want, but like one side will feed the model and the other will just consume and talk to the model. And I think that's not that far away. And I think it kind of makes a lot of things irrelevant. There are some people in, in the tech space that talk about like, why do we even need software? 
we're not even going to have software as a service anymore. That's not going to be a Salesforce or a chat product like Zendesk or an LMS like Edgeflow. Because we're just going to be talking to models. It's going to be models as a service instead. And I think that's super interesting. And I don't know if that's what's going to happen, but it's like, it's going to change a lot of things. It even, maybe it's going to kill us, right? Like maybe Edgeflow goes out of business this way. And that's kind of interesting for me to think about at least what's going to, what's going to kill us in three years. Anybody? William? You're still here, William? I can see you. He's on mute. Can't find the unmute button. Hmm. There's a lot of power outages in South Africa right now. Maybe he's. Uh... <laughs> I can see uh, Johannes Kronja has raised his hand. Johannes, are you able to like unmute yourself or uh, do we need uh, me to do that somehow? I have to make William the co host, but I don't know how to do that. Uh, uh, I'll make William a, a host again. Okay, so I've unmuted. Um, I'm yes. hoping. Oh, cool. All right. Yeah, I, I, I was. I'm, I'm fascinated by this whole thing, as you know, David. Um, but, but, um, I, th I think what what Francie put in here just now about the photographer's response and and my concept to that that suddenly photography came and brought high quality um, things. And then artists were saying, well, what are we gonna do now? And then artists moved into conceptual work such as impressionism and so on. And I, I sort of think maybe, maybe there's going to be a, a demand for analog in the, in the wake of, um, uh, in, in the, you know, what, what do we humans have that, that the machines don't have? And that is our, unpredictability, our warmth. Um, uh, the machines can simulate warmth, but they, they can't really cry with us. They can just pretend to be crying with us. So, so I think, and then the other thing I, I said right in the beginning here that I feel vindicated because, because Bloom was correct in his taxonomy by putting evaluation higher than creation because AI can create very easily, but finding true value, um, th that is a human attribute. And I think what we need to teach, and, and you pointed that out, that uh, e the, the machine can also evaluate, the machine can tell us this is the better option than that, because the machine can, can look at the two options, weigh those two options. But when it eventually comes to making that decision, I think that's the skill we need to teach, not so much critical thinking, but the decision making that's based on top of that critical thinking, because a lot of decision, in fact, most of the decision making in the world is not based on logic, it's based on emotion. And, and, and the machine will probably for a long time still do the logical thing. And, and so we're, we're going to have to do a whole lot of changing in our teaching into humanizing the, the teaching that we're doing. I, I had a long discussion with um, a lecture, the, the head of a, a film school here in Cape Town and based on exactly what's he gonna do next year. And what's he gonna have to teach his students is going to be how to be a filmmaker. Um, not how to use the technology, but what is the essence underneath all that technology that makes you a filmmaker? And then you can find whatever the technology is necessary. And we have to rethink what that, that essence is that makes us a doctor or that makes us a dentist. It's not the tools. It's, it's the, 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 the sort of the humanity underneath it that we're gonna have to look at. Sorry about the brief um, outage there, everyone. <laughs> um, my Zoom is having a bit of a, um, a wobble. Um, so <laughs> if I do cut out, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I, I actually wanted to, to add to this because I've been thinking about it uh, for a while as well. Um, there's, uh, John Briggs has this thing called the solo taxonomy, um, which, which, which kind of like tries to help us find different levels of understanding. Um, and I think frameworks like that are going to be 
very, very um, important in the near future um, to find something that that makes um, makes it possible to evaluate um, that like deeper level of of, of understanding or, or way of reasoning and and putting things together in in, in something that at this moment. Um, robots can't do but maybe they can do soon um, and then another thing I was also thinking about is that there's probably going to be this big risk soon where everyone is going to start just content dumping um, so we are going to probably have to be very careful about making sure that our content or not our content our solutions solve real problems um, and you, you know Right now, I think there's going to be a big risk that a lot of curriculums are out of date to, tomorrow or right now because AI is already replacing a lot of stuff that is going to be re redundant. Um, yeah, so the, the, those are some of my, my two cents. <laughs> um, I think I want to, uh, David, I see you've got a hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, it's just, I think there's a lot of like reactions to like, but well, humans can do this and humans can do that. Humans can do like, they can only pretend to cry. They can only, they can't do lateral thinking. They can't, like it's not real skilled i think i disagree on all premises on, on like that right computers can laterally think we are we emotional or are we just pretending to be emotional i don't think that's there's a true distinguishment here if the human if the ai can pretend to cry as well as a human does it matter if it's real crying is that does it's like i think that's like a weird well, it's not human, a human that's crying, so it's not real crying. I think that's a mistake to, to think about it that way. And, and AI is surely skilled. But when it comes to like job replacement, for example, there is this old Oxford study about like in which order will we get replaced? Which jobs go first and which jobs go last? And I think they, they have something right in that study about the last jobs to go are the ones where we still want a human to do it, even if it doesn't make sense. Like maybe an AI can take care of your kids, but you might not want it. Maybe you can get a robot dentist, but it feels dirty. It feels like a big risk to take. So a psychologist, maybe we want to talk to a human, even if the AI psychologist is a better psychologist. I think there'll be a long period where people cling to this feeling of humanness. And I think if we want to survive in the job market for as long as possible, be as human as possible, right? Be as little like an AI as you can, because that the more like an AI you, you perform, like the more easily you are to replace. Uh, will it last forever? Maybe not, probably not in my mind, but I think it will expand our like time in the relevant part of the job market for as long as we can, right? If we are as little like a robot as, as we can possibly be. Cool. Um, I think maybe we can start opening. We've got 10 minutes left um, and I'd, I'd really like to involve the, the, the like turn this last few minutes into a and a So um, I want to invite everyone who's in the chat right now to maybe fire off um, a few questions for for David or, or Philippa, or you could put up a hand and we can unmute you to, um, to share your ideas. Um, uh, yeah. Oh, I see there are already questions coming in. Um, uh, well, we have to decouple the connection between work and money, says Johannes. Uh, who would like to take this one on? That's a very like sociological question. <laughs> I, I, I also I, I'm wondering because you know like at, at the moment there's a, a, lot, a big relationship between you know human performance and your value in society to some extent but what if a lot of the stuff that you know like a lot of the stuff that humans used to produce you know like what if humans just uh, don't need to do it anymore um you know how's it going to change society but i guess that's a very um political question <laughs> maybe alluding to um uh, philippa's uh, remark earlier about the um uh turning into communism or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh communism through automation but it's a really interesting point and i have linked to the book if anyone's interested there are quite some good summaries out there if you don't want to read the whole thing because it's a bit a bit dense uh but it's an interesting point about like are we uh are we just stuck in a way of thinking um about work and money and if we are then what yeah how do we bring value into the world and how um 
like what yeah what's our economic role is just a yeah it's a huge question that I am not clever enough to answer but it is um it's pertinent and for me what this underlines is like how interesting AI is like I think it's interesting as a piece of technology but it's also interesting for the questions that it raises about um the purpose of lots of very interesting things so like as a as a political conversation um it's yeah, I feel like it's it's reawakened people to to politics, which I think is a is always a positive thing. Awesome, William. Will you uh, just guide this discussion because that's a lot of good questions here. You can just pick. One. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm trying to like go through all of them quickly. Um, uh, and my Zoom is not letting me scroll up and down. So excuse me, everyone. <laughs> um, I think Griff has a, a um a, a good question here. Um, about should we emphasize the importance of conversation and um maybe that goes back again to our chat about chatbots um and uh you know this this element on your shoulder that's going to help you to um, focus on the right stuff um you know uh are you know are, are chatbots and stuff going to replace facilitators as the coach um even in the near term um i remember philippa we were talking about a philippa bot or something like that as a, a potential um instructional tool to maybe help to scale learning i mean that could be really really amazing way of using this yeah absolutely and as i mentioned earlier like that is already happening um in higher ed anyway you know that experimentation has already ha um happened and they have been able to reproduce expertise to the extent that they can answer questions give feedback and this kind of thing so i think the answer to that question is yes i do think that will happen like a related question that i have there which i'd be interested in hearing everyone's thoughts on is like we talk a lot now about how uh, an effective lear like learning experience requires an amount of connection a feeling of being seen connection with the expert but also with uh with a community and we talked about this actually in a session that i led last night how important it was like yes the content that i delivered was important but more so were the conversations that came off it and so the question that that keeps coming back to me is like when we think about learning and ai is it a is it is it going to become a solitary uh endeavor does it feel connected enough if we are, for example, coached by a bot? Or are we still going to have a need and an appetite to somehow bring in other humans to these automated experiences? I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's uh, it will be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah. A, a tangential idea around that is this idea of like, I was listening to a conversation about AI and like uh, media, like producing movies, for example. And and maybe there are some things we today expect that are not true in the future, right? So today, a team of Hollywood producers make a movie and then everybody watches the same movie. And then in the old days, there was just one movie, right, that everybody watched in the country at Friday night. And then now you have Netflix, so you can pick and choose your own movies. But maybe the natural next level of that is that everybody watches their own version of the movie, right? Why do we even need to have mass production? moves produce movies if the ai can produce a movie it will just know exactly what you want and and what you like and then it will produce it exactly to your needs and wants so everybody has their own version and i think that you could take that to learning right i don't think we will need to have the same learning content or experience for different people everybody will just be tapping into this bank of information and then you will you'll get it in the way that you need it when you need it and, and i think that's kind of that's what will happen really soon. Um, I also want to become a little bit more practical, right? So there was a question here from like, what do you need? What's the advice if you want to start to learn about this? I think the obvious first thing that's going to happen is that we're going to move from creating content to like, dictating what content needs to be created by the AI, right? That's the obvious kind of first thing that's going to happen and it's already happening. So. I think the first thing to try out now is to play with some of these language models like TV3 and try to figure out like, how do I use this to my advantage when writing things, for example. So you can give outlines and it will fill out most of the text. It could come up with ideas and so on. And like use it as a co-creating tool and as a tool to like produce longer content, for example. I think that's gonna help a lot. It already helps me and William when we do our work, we use it daily to produce different types of content. Um, so I think that's the first 
place to go and try this out right now is these language models. Um, I think that maybe uh, maybe we should end on that note because we've got three minutes left and um, I want to give everyone some uh, uh, time to to give a shout out to all the things that we should be um, following and looking at. Um, uh, I want to I posted a link in the the chat here about uh, this uh, um, AI course that uh, David and I have of trying to build in the open. So it's got a quick module on what is AI and some quick definitions, and it gives you an opportunity to play around and, and practice using these tools. Um, and we're also building a, a bit of a knowledge base of the different types of tools out there. So feel free to sign up for the course. It's totally free and, and you can um, come explore with us. We'll, um, if you're part of this community, we'll be inviting you to all of our future events and stuff like that. Um, uh, Philippa, where can we find you and, and what are you, what are you working on right now? Uh, you can find me first and foremost on, uh, LinkedIn. You can connect with me. You can follow me, whatever you prefer. Right now I am working on two things. One is helping, uh, learning designers get to grips with uh, AI technology and this like associated set of new skills, which is more focused on like an understand like this new value that we bring as people who understand what content to build and what to build around it in order to make to give it value. So in this world where things are very like content's commoditized, focusing in on how we bring value to that content. Um, and I'm also doing some, yeah, some research on on AI and uh, what this might mean for the future of education, which is very cool. So I will keep posting about that. But yeah, if you see me, if you get me on LinkedIn, you can uh, subscribe to my free newsletter and uh, get everything you need to know there. Cool. And David, uh, do you have any closing remarks and do you want to point toward anything we should be looking at? No, go and play. The tools change so fast, right? The tool that I'm talking about today is replaced tomorrow by something new. Um, the, place, the best place to follow along is obviously like social media. And then I would, I personally just subscribe to two resources here and it's the newsletters of OpenAI and DeepMind. The two like big big players in the space. DeepMind is the AI research center at Google, and then OpenAI is their own uh, research center for AI. And these two organizations are really pushing everything right now. So just subscribe to their newsletters, and you'll get updates whenever they launch something new. And that's essentially what you need: and uh, a LinkedIn or Twitter profile. Uh, everything is outdated in five minutes, so just like try to keep up as we go. Sorry, my, my Zoom is like a two second delay. So when I click a button, it takes, okay. Um, so yeah, uh, my final note, I, I guess, is um, thank you so much, um, Philippa and David for your time. Um, I, yeah, I really appreciate it. Um, I think this has been an, an incredibly valuable conversation. We've got some, um, uh, just this recording is going to be awesome to to share and, and um, to Kind of keep this conversation going um i also want to say thank you to everyone who has joined us um for these uh you know uh, for this hour <laughs> um and uh, I, I always find it amazing when the like keeping track of the participant count so we were on 47 pretty much throughout the entire session um and that for me is is a testament that this was a really nice engaging session so um thank you very much everyone um we will be in touch um Thank you so much.